I would like to welcome today Nadia Mokbul uh, 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 to Localized. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, the topic that we're really talking about today is sustainable architecture. And, and Nadia is unique in that she uh, can give us a lot of insight about uh, architecture. She has experience uh, traveling abroad, returning back home. She's also started uh, her own company. So it's uh, always a great opportunity to learn from an entrepreneur that has really done it with their own hands and learn about their journey. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to, co to cover these topics today. Nadia, welcome to uh, Localized. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm so excited. I mean, I'm, I'm a new discoverer of Localized, thanks to my fellow YGL, Ronit, who was amazing and so brave and so generous in, in giving me her time and inviting me to, to speak. Um, it's just a privilege and an honor to, to, to be connected to all of your students all over the world. The privilege is ours and for all of our community. Uh, so, so to kick this off, Nadia, I, I'd like to, uh, if you could just give us a bit of a background about yourself, uh, your education quickly, and then maybe walk us through uh, your journey uh, just for context uh, yeah. as we kick off this, uh, this session. Please. Okay, so um, um, I'm, I'm based in Oman. I'm Omani. I live in Muscat, but I come from a very cultural background. My mother is Peruvian from Latin America, and my parents met each other at Oklahoma State University. So the reason I like to mention this is because from very early in my, uh, in my story, identity became a very important thing and appreciation of identity beyond beliefs and religion and language, you know, identity was also very much something that was about landscape, about how people intervene with that landscape, buildings in the landscape. And I very quickly learned that how this can be done in a way that complements and expands landscape or deter detracts from landscape. And these were things that were cooking in my head from a child. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, you, grow up and you go into middle school and high school and the question of what are you going to be when you grow up starts you know to take up a lot of headspace and I, I I could not decide between the arts and the sciences and in Oman the public school education you have to make a choice between ilmi and adabi you know um, science and the arts and I just couldn't make that it was really difficult for me and thank heavens I, I moved into a private school before I had to make that decision so I was able to dabble in both but academics in this part of the world is is science you know you cannot be academic in the arts it, it's still i think new so even though i was able to dabble in arts and continue arts and sculpture and you know the, the the creative expression sciences were still you know like heavy in my timetable so when the time came i thought about architecture and i thought about so many other things you know just to give you a perspective of I had no idea, you know, like at 18, 19 years old, I, I really didn't know because it was between architecture and gynecology. What do they have in common? Nothing. Nadia, that's what they have in common. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think, and I think it's, some people know exactly what they want. I wasn't one of them. And uh, I was very lucky because uh, what helped me was that I had a, I had a, a, grad, a percentage, um, my final grade enabled me to apply for a scholarship. And there was a public list of scholarships on offer at that time, and architecture was one of them, and it was in Arabic, Hendesa Ma'amariya. So I selected it, and, and I knew what it was. I knew that it was design and art and engineering. And then, um, and then in the, in, I, I got it. I was very lucky. I got the scholarship, and then suddenly um, um, I realized it got translated back into architectural engineering. And I thought, you know, that's fine. It's okay. I didn't really understand the intricacy between the two. So I ended up going to Leeds University and studying architectural engineering. I did a foundation first, and then I did one year of architectural engineering. And I realized that this is this is engineering with, a, with an architectural module. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Oman. And I think one of the best things that I did was I started going for internships really early on in my, in my, in my education, you know. Um, unpaid internship just to expose myself to the profession and how the profession is practiced in my country. 
-hmm. And I quickly realized that what I was doing was engineering with a little bit of architecture and what I wanted to do was architecture with a little bit of engineering. So through this process, I mean, it was, I was, it was my first, I had just completed my first year of architectural engineering and I was interning at a, at an engineering, a multidisciplinary studio. Mm -hmm. And I realized what I was, what I was going to go back to if I didn't change course. And I quickly changed course. And I was very lucky that I was able to change course. And because I had done a foundation in architecture, I knew what architectural schools I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I kind of like knew who my architectural role models were. So I had studied about the Glasgow School of Arts and Charles Rene Mackintosh and the Art Nouveau movement. And it really resonated with me. So I knew what I wanted which is not something that I could have done when I first got the scholarship. You know, I never chose yeah. Leeds University. The country chose it for me. So, you know, alhamdulillah, things happen for a reason. And I changed and I studied architecture. And throughout, and during my studies, I realized that you can become a chartered architect. You need to invest more time at studying, but it gives you like a passport when you graduate to practice architecture anywhere in the world. And that's what I wanted. You know, my father was one of the first chartered accountants in the country, and I was like, I'm going to be one of the first charts. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it became this, it, it became like a mission and, and it's a passion and architecture is very much a passion. I mean, all of you in the, in the, all participants have a background for, in architecture or design. You know that, you know, the exam isn't so much a grade. It's about producing, proposing something that you can defend, you resonate with. Mm. Even just on paper during university, you're just drawing it and you're just building models yeah. and it's all in your imagination. But that passion, that connection with your work has to exist and it continues to exist. So um, it, it's what kept me, it's what, it, what, it's what fueled me through my, uh, my studies. Mm. And I graduated and I got a, an opportunity to work in London mm. and I able to become a chartered architect during that uh, during that time and I came back to Oman at around 20, 2009 during this during during like the economic upheaval at the time yeah. when um, you know my company in London actually let me go but because okay. it was an international company they um, they said you know look for opportunities in Muscat we have an office in Muscat and you would be very desirable there now okay. Maybe I'll talk about this later, but um, it was amazing to have that kind of experience because in Oman, there's a lot of Omanization and what does that mean? But to be on the other end where I had to prove my my work as an expat in a different country, as a professional expat, that's mm -hmm. a different perspective and, and the competitiveness that comes along with that. Yeah. So I don't know, Ahmed, do you want me to stop here? And then- uh, so, so this is good. There's, there's, there's a couple of, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. There's a couple of things that really uh, uh, stand out here. So, so you were able to, or you had the opportunity to travel uh, for yes. your education. Yes. Um, uh, and then you went into architect. You were able to um, to try out something and change. So, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about, right? Because yes. the opportunity to travel might not be available to everybody, but everybody in Oman, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Lebanon, there is the opportunity to study architecture. So the opportunity is there. So let me ask you about changing or shifting your career that first year. How difficult of a decision was that? Were, did, did, were, is that a decision that you were able to take independently or did you have to, did you have to kind of um, navigate the parents uh, getting involved or how was that? Did you need to convince them? And how about did you go to, and just walk us through the, the, the thought process. Was that a difficult decision to make? Was it? No, for me, it was a very easy decision. And it was a very okay. easy decision because I tried it. I was in an office. I tried. I was very lucky because it was a multidisciplinary office. Mm -hmm. I was able to work with the engineer, structural engineers for one week and do mm -hmm. a little project with them and help them with their work. And then I was able to work with the mechanical engineers for a week. And then I was able to work with the interior designers for a week and do a little project. And then when I settled, when I, when I arrived at architecture, that's where my heart sang. And I knew that is yeah. what I wanted to do. Actually, yeah. I really enjoyed the structural engineering aspect as well. And, you know, I was kind of like, you know, maybe, maybe this is what I meant to do. But when I did architecture, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Now, because my parents didn't fund my education, I was on a government scholarship. My parents didn't really have a say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was my decision. Okay. And, um, and all I had to do was I had to convince 
the government, you know, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Higher Education here that this is what, this is why I want to change. And I was really lucky because in those days, I don't know how it is now, but in those days for all Omani scholars, they had a lot of contingency to do many years of language and foundation before they actually study their career. So mm -hmm. as, a, as an Omani scholar, I had that contingency, but I didn't use it. Yeah. You know, my language and everything was already good. So I could technically how, how they were able to justify the, the, the change, the shift in career, and not as you wasted a, a year of our money doing engineering. Yeah. It wasn't a way because it just fell into, you know, that contingency. So I didn't okay. have to apply for an additional year, if you if you understand what yes, I mean. Yes, yes, absolutely. That, that would have been the burden, but it wasn't a burden for me, alhamdulillah. It was it's relatively easy. Yes. And I knew, and then and then they just asked me, okay, fine, you get your acceptance and we will we will we will fund it. That is amazing. So I did it myself and it was quite easy. That's amazing. So so let, let me ask you about that. Because so maybe you were lucky enough to have that year, right? To have that opportunity. Because uh, and it seems like a couple of things fell in place nicely together, where you got an internship at a company where you're able to see all the different aspects of engineering, so you can really firsthand see what does this look like going uh, forward, and you found the thing that you loved, and then that directed you towards uh, towards a, a, a um, an educational choice. Some people don't have that opportunity. Do you have recommendations or, or from, I'm sure now you see a lot of students also, maybe people applying for jobs or recent graduates of architecture. Do you have a recommendation at this point if a student is going into college or they're in their first year of college, maybe even their second year of college, and they're not sure what they want. They don't know if this is where they want, right? Like in the same situation like you're in, what recommendations can you give for students to be able to really fine tune where that which direction to go to, right? Uh, do you have any yeah. recommendations for, for for students in that situation? It's it's not the end of the world if you okay. study. You know, you are usually guided. I mean, there there is an element of trust and and and, and knowing that you are being guided in something that you are going to enjoy, mm -hmm. and. You know, for example, if I would have stayed in architectural engineering, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. I don't think my life would have changed completely. You know, the entrepreneurial seed in me was still there. Mm -hmm. My love for sustainable design and sustainable architecture is still there. I may have become a sustainable engineer instead of a sustainable architect. I may have become an entrepreneur in an engineering field. And the studio that I, I later on set up, the culture, the way of work, you know, these things, they, these are the things that really resonate with me, the work that I produce, the people that I work with, and the, the people that I am able to inspire and the clients. These mm -hmm. are things that really, these are the things that are really important. And they wouldn't have changed. They, you know, it would have been the same whether I was an architect or an engineer. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that if, if you if you find yourself in that situation, and you want to change, but you can't focus mm -hmm. on the common ground. You know, yeah. what does architecture and engineering have in common? Yeah. And focus on that instead of focusing on the differences. Because you can always focus on the differences and then, you know, you become the, you become a victim of I don't have the choice. Yeah. But you always do have the choice. You have the choice to focus on the common ground and then explore within that common ground what you want. Because as a bachelor, as a bachelor degree, the professions, the careers that we choose are so broad Mm -hmm. that you can carve a niche in anything. Mm -hmm. I love that, by the way. I, I think that's fantastic advice, honestly. It's, yeah, it's, very, very well said. Thank you. So, so let, let me tell you about, so let me, you mentioned that you did a lot of internships as well. Yes. Um, tell me, do you recommend that students do a lot of internships? Yes, and yes. can you give us recommendations on if you were able to get into a lot of internships? How, how do you go about that? What's the process of searching for internships? Did you do internships in Oman? Did you do them abroad? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, what, calling them, I'm calling them internships. Uh -huh. But, you know, internship, summer jobs. 
Yeah. That's what they were. In my experience, they were summer jobs because they weren't organized by my university. I studied in Glasgow. I came back to Amman for my summer holidays and I looked for practices. You know, I researched. In those days, there was no Instagram. There was no Twitter. It was much harder to find. You know, I was looking through magazines and, yeah. and I was looking at, 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 at buildings on the streets and looking at the billboards and any building that I liked that I was curious about, then I would, I would note down their phone number, their name, and I would contact them. I would visit them. And um, I would just be like, you know, I'm just here on my summer holiday. I'm studying architecture. I'd like to spend some time in your studio. And huh. I would fold drawings. In those days, we, they printed out A1 drawings. I would fold these drawings. I would spend hours folding drawings and getting paper cuts. I would make tea and coffee. I would sit in, like my favorite time was just to sit in on meetings with the clients because that was something fascinating for me, just to, just to be able to witness how the in the architect and the engineer were able to communicate an idea and how that idea evolved into plans and sections and then see how the client reacted to that or even the first meeting when the client comes in and says you know I have this piece of land and I want to build this and this is what I need mm -hmm. just being able to see how that communication goes going on site seeing how the architect communicates with the contractor seeing how the contractor communicates to all of his subcontractors and suppliers this is fascinating information and you don't get paid. This is an investment in yourself mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the more you do this, the more you are able to, to put yourself in situations where you can say, I don't like that. I don't want to do that again. I'm not going to pursue this anymore. Or I really like this. I'm really curious about this. And I'm going to pursue this in my education and in my experience in the future. Yeah. And this is, this is invaluable because you learn so much more about yourself and you are investigating, you're digging about what is it that Nadia can uniquely contribute in this industry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what you want to know. This is your gift that you can contribute in this line of work. And that is what that that is the best satisfaction that you can have. And you're not going to know it in the beginning, but this yeah. is the perfect way to discover it for yourself. Do, do you ever feel embarrassed or maybe fear, fear that you're going to be uh, not let down, but rejected uh, from any of these companies as you're doing that, this process. And obviously now this is much easier, right? You can get on LinkedIn, there's the internet. So that process is significantly easier now. But, but I, I, a lot of people are, are, are worried to take that step. I mean, I've been rejected so much, Ahmed. I was yeah. applying for jobs. So this is, this is outside my summer holiday. This is when, when I finished my bachelor's, I had my bachelor's and you have a year out in the UK that you're, mm -hmm. you're meant to work and, and log in your experience. And I wanted to work in the UK. My dream was to gain experience working in the UK because I had already been traveling every summer to Oman and I had summer, summer experience. And part of me gaining so much Armani summer experience was to build up this confidence to be able to work in, uh, in, in the UK. In the UK. Yeah. And so much rejection. Like I probably sent out a hundred CVs huh. and received, and you know, some, most people don't even respond. And some yeah. people respond nicely saying, you know, we don't have any vacancies. We, we, yeah. we can't take you because, you know, for me working in the UK meant that I needed, I needed the income. Yes. You know, I had to have salary. In retrospect, I could have saved and then I could have worked for free and then I would have I would have endured less rejection, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, you cannot be afraid of rejection. It, it is you are shooting yourself before you even try, you know, and the best thing to combat rejection is now to apply to work for your heroes. If you're going to be rejected, yeah. Be rejected by a hero huh. because don't be rejected by you know somebody who's nothing be rejected huh. by the heroes yeah. and then that, that builds up your confidence and keep trying because because these heroes of yours are heroes of many and lots yes. of people apply to them yes. and you become one of them and it becomes all about you know really crafting your cv really crafting your your letter or your email or your video application and just making them really interested in you and when yes. they reject you, they are not rejecting Nadia. You know, they yeah. are just rejecting the opportunity of, of having you in the office. So, you know, just, just yeah. be clear about that rejection. They're not rejecting me. They're not rejecting my person. They're not rejecting my talent, my skill. No, they're just saying no 
to offering you the opportunity of interning with them. And really good companies will not say yes to everyone because by then you know, we, we have a cap. We cannot take everyone, especially if we're not paying them because when we're not paying them, then there is more responsibility for us to ensure that we are really educating them. We are really giving them the experience and the exposure that they want. Mm-hmm. So when you get rejected, just you're not rejected because of you. You're just rejected because maybe you were a little bit late in applying. Mm-hmm. Keep trying. If the hero is big enough, then keep trying, and inshallah, it will work out. Yeah, I and mean, I love the idea of the hero because that like gives you motivation to really like polish your CV, polish your letter, because you're, you're, you're talking to somebody that you really respect or is your hero. Yeah, uh, So that's definitely. a great motiva- self-motivator to, to, to be the best that you can be. Awesome. So, so l- let's move on. So Ed, you, we talked about your undergraduate, then you, we understand you went into architecture. Yes. How did your career progress after that? So I graduated mm-hmm. and I was lucky enough to work in London. Now mm-hmm. I, was, I was able to work in London because I found a multinational company. Mm-hmm. And this is a good hint for you guys. Find a multinational company that has a project in your country. Sure. And you guys are even luckier because like say for example, Ahmed, you're an architect yeah. and you study in Egypt and you want to travel and work abroad. Yeah. You find an international company that has won a project in Egypt. Yeah. And you apply to them. This is so. This is what happened to me. I, I got a job at an at a multinational company that had a project in Oman, and the design team was based in London. So I worked with that design team, and it was amazing. It was fantastic. Awesome. That's really so, good advice. Yeah, this, this it worked with me beautifully. Yeah. Except that I came, I graduated from an art school, so you know it was an architecture. Yeah. part of Glasgow University, but it came from an art school, which meant that I was surrounded. We were bohemians, you know, we were like, we don't care about the money. It's all about the boutique. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I felt a bit like a traitor when <laughs> I ended up working for a commercial design office. It's like, you know, I got paid well, I've got really good benefits. I got, I got a really good package, yeah. but you know, it was like, I was working with those guys who show up in suits every day, <laughs> you know, and I used to get lots of comments about how we were not creative. We were just pursuing the money, but it worked for me. You know, it, it, yeah. it's what I wanted. It's, and to be honest, I didn't have any other choice as well. I tried to apply for those boutique studio firms. Uh-huh. And because I'm Omani, mm-hmm. and this is again, like, you know, this whole thing about you have to prove your worth because mm-hmm. they in the UK, for example, they have to employ British citizens. Mm-hmm. And if they employ somebody who's not a British citizen, then the next level of priority has to be an EU citizen. Yes. And then, and for them to, to, they have to prove to the foreign office or, you know, the immigration office or whatever, that we are employing Nadia because she has special skill set that the British architects don't have and the EU architects don't have. Yeah. Specifically in my case, it's because I can, I can insert this cultural sensibility in design because they have a, a large project that's based in Oman. Yeah. So work with that, use that. These are your innate skills that you didn't even have to work for, you didn't have to study. You yeah. know, these, this is your plus point. So work yeah. with your plus point. And that's Amazing. That's, for me. that's That's great advice, I love that. Uh, so, so then you had mentioned then that you left London, you started looking for that same company in Oman or, or did yeah, you? So, Okay. So what happened is it was the economic crisis of t- 2009 and there were lots of job losses yeah. and um, my, my team started looking at that and, you know, we were told before we were told that you need to look for a job, we were told how we could be redistributed. And for me, it was really easy because I could be redistributed to Oman mm-hmm. and I did that. I took that opportunity. I had been in London for four years. And it was time for me to go back to Amman. I felt comfortable. I couldn't find another job in in London. You know, I knew that Mm -hmm. the time that this is a new a new step for me. So I came back to Amman, and I worked for the same company in Amman. We worked on much much larger projects, and it was great because now I was an Omani working in an Oman office with other Omanis and expats, but I had international experience. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's amazing. And that international experience was, was wonderful because, you know, 
in Oman, and I don't know how many of our participants resonate with this, but in Oman, you have an Omanization rate. Studios, okay. architecture companies need to demonstrate that they are achieving around 40% Omanization, which means 40% of their team has to be Omani. And anytime they, they, they submit an application for an expat engineer or architect, they will not get approved until okay. they demonstrate this Omanization. Okay. So unfortunately, many companies just hire bums on seats and there's no expectation huh. of these Omanis to perform. They're just there to tick that box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed this. I saw, I saw it in my, in my office. I saw lots of Omanis who didn't have any aspiration to be anything beyond what they were hired mm -hmm. to do. Okay. And it's really, really sad. It's, it's, it's horrible. But mm -hmm. I saw this and I knew that this is, this is not what I was. Mm -hmm. So I was never comparing myself to, to these people. I was always comparing myself to the expats. Okay. I wanted to earn the salary that the expat was earning. I wanted yeah. to earn the benefits and the packages that the expat was earning. Yeah. And I, I joined this company with the, with the understanding. It was quite naive, but I thought that they would hire me with my, ex, with, you know, my expat salary and I would just get the Amani benefits. Yeah. But of course, unfortunately, what I realized later on was that because I'm Omani, I'm not entitled to the expat salary. And yeah. that was the biggest shock that I had. And it was already the beginnings of me already knowing that this is going to be a temporary arrangement. You know, mm -hmm. I am here to satisfy a goal. And after I satisfy this goal, I'm going to leave because ethically, mm -hmm. I'm not happy with the way that this culture is, this, this okay. culture of expats and locals. And yeah. so... These are things that, you know, it, it's it's good to be aware of and it's good to to have a stance and have a yeah. say. And my my managers knew this from the very beginning and they knew okay. they kind of like I was very open with them and they knew that this is not going to be someone who's going to stay with us forever. And hmm. that is good and bad. It's good yeah. because you have that clarity, but it's also bad because they're ne they're never going to invest in you. Yeah, I mean, basically. Yes. I mean, because I was, and then the other thing is I was a very, there weren't very many Armani architects. So I was in okay. a privileged position to be unique yeah. in that I'm Armani, I'm an architect, I have international experience. So I could always look at my managers and it was always like, they're, they're always thinking, if we want to invest in her, we need to invest a lot in her because she's not going to settle for anything less. You know, they already knew that my, my, yeah. my sites were yeah. set at being equal to the expats that you are bringing from abroad. I want to do yeah. that. And because okay. I want to do that job, I expect that compensation. Mm -hmm. That is how they had to deal with me. That's how they had to treat me. And that comes with political upheaval, right? Because as soon as the yeah. Omanis discover that, then first of all, they're inspired to be like me, which is great, but is it really great for the employer? Can they yeah. afford it? You know, so... So lots of things happen. When I decided to leave that company, they did offer me to stay, but, and they did offer me what I wanted, but it was too late. Okay. I was like, okay. too excited about, about setting up my own practice. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the big things that did it for me to set up my own practice was, you know, I, I, I evolved within that multi-organizational company to a level where I was engaging, you know, I became a, 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 a lead of, of large projects and I was engaging directly with clients. And, and because I was Armani, our clients were Armani, they were mostly the government. Yeah. I was able to really listen to their aspirations, what they wanted, you know, their, their vision, their big dreams. Mm -hmm. And I would want to, to tell my company, this is, what, this is what they're saying. And my company would be like, yeah, that's what they always say, but this is what they actually mean. And huh. they would just rehash the yeah. same stuff that they did for previous clients. And yeah. for me, that was another big marker that no, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to rehash work. I want to innovate. Yeah. I want to meet my clients at the same level yeah. of innovation. You know, I want I want to innovate for yeah. their problems as opposed to telling them that actually your problem isn't really this, your problem is this. Yeah. So 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 let, let me let me stop you here and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, architecture about the big companies 
about the little crypto. I, I assume, and I could be wrong, but I assume that this idea comes from the fact that this is a big multinational. They have a, a pipeline of things. There's things that they do well. So you tell them something, you're like, yeah, but you really need this. And I can understand as an architect, uh, as somebody that has arts in your in your heart, that this doesn't really work for you. And I assume this is the same for many architects as well. So your solution was, I'm going to start a business, right? Where I can really think about innovations. Before we get into that, are there other ways to get to that same goal other than starting your own business? Totally. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yes, I mean, definitely. Like I said, when I, when I, when I told them that I was going to leave, mm -hmm. they offered me what I wanted. You know, and just being clear with them, having that having that transparency. And if you are able to work really hard and prove your worth to them, then maybe they will not pay you your worth initially, but eventually they will. Mm -hmm. And I was I was on the verge of getting there. You know, I, I could have been like a director. I could have been regional mm -hmm. country manager if I stayed at that company, I think. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to set up your own practice. I think the reason that I chose to set up practice is because it was... It was a childhood dream for me to set up my own practices, what I wanted to do. I knew this is what I wanted to do when I was a student of architecture. I knew it. Hmm. But, but you know, I could have easily been an entrepreneur within that company. And I think they would have appreciated, for, appreciated me for it. So, um, so, yeah, I think my advice in this case would be just to, I mean, you have to know you have to create your own limits. You know, I'm going to do it up until this limit. And then you set ultimatums and you communicate it to them. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, do not sell yourself short ever. Okay. Can you, elab can you elaborate on that point? If you believe that you are not being paid your worth, uh -huh. then you need to say it. You need to communicate it. Never belittle yourself. Never think, oh, no, but I am, I am lucky to have this. Other people okay. have less than me. You know, yeah. yes, sometimes it's good to be grateful for what you have. Uh -huh. but don't ever let it become a point of resentment or making it make you feel small. La huh. You have to always think about how are you investing in yourself before you think about how others are investing in you. If you stay in a company that is not motivating you, then you are not investing in yourself. And if you are not investing in yourself, do not expect others to invest in you. I, I absolutely agree with that. That's, uh, again, very well said. So, so let, let me ask for, from an architectural perspective. So I'm, uh, uh, in my mind, when I was preparing for this, I thought, okay, let's talk about the process of being getting into architecture, but I don't think we need to do that, right? If, if, if you're already studying architecture, then you already know, uh, know these things. The question for you is when you graduated, um, you mentioned that you had applied to boutique firms but you weren't able to get in. Truly, that, that maybe your particular situation was a little bit more tricky as you were a foreign resident and then the boutique firms are not able to, um, to sponsor somebody. If, there's, there's that element of it. But what about, so let's assume people in, in their own home countries graduating as architects. What is your recommendation between three things. So a large company, which is the path that you decided to take, going for a smaller company, or potentially starting up your, your own business. Okay. So Tell when us, you yeah, graduate, mm -hmm. when you graduate, I absolutely do not recommend that you start your own practice immediately. Okay. You know, so that don't go there. Don't, don't go there. Don't go there because you don't have enough experience. You know, our education at university is very, it's like being in a laboratory. You need to be able to apply what you've learned and apply what you've learned in the country that you are choosing to, to work in. So for example, for me, I, I felt that I needed to come back to Oman, work in Oman before I can set up practice. It wasn't enough that I had gained four years experience in London. La. Hmm. You know, so th there, is, there is knowledge there is the application of knowledge in different contexts and make sure that you have the knowledge of applying. You have the experience of applying your knowledge in the context that you want to set up practice for. 
This is in preparation of you setting a practice, say if you wanted to set up your practice in the future. This is what I would recommend that you do. Mm -hmm. Also, um, by working in different companies, you kind of know what, what you like and what you don't like. You start creating a little wish list of what my company is going to look like. So for example, I worked in many companies and, and my partner worked in many companies. And when we, we set up, we decided to set up together, we recalled all of our most favorite experiences. You know, we like to work in companies that had no hierarchy when it came to actually working. We sure. all work around the same table. We all witness each other's on their telephone conversations, talking to their clients. You know, um, I, I could be instructing or teaching a, a graduate how to do something and he's sitting next to another architect. And you know, the, there is this information that flows, this knowledge that is always flowing and it's shared. So yeah. this is something that we really liked. And we wouldn't have known that we liked this if we hadn't tried to work in different companies. Yeah, yes. Yes. this is for an entrepreneur or, or, or an architect who knows that they want to set up their practice in the future. These are tips on how to educate yourself to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when you graduate, definitely get a job. Between the between the boutique and the international international multinational uh, firm, it's really where you resonate with. When I graduated. In my year, there were many very good architecture students that wanted to become corporate architects. You know, this is what they want. They like it. This is, you know, they like to go for their meetings. There's a process of producing architecture that is commercial and it works and people like it. And there's mm -hmm. no shame in that. You know, it wasn't my preference. I wanted to be more artistic. I wanted to be more experimental. I wanted to be more innovative. I wanted to be an award winner. This is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I aspired. I wanted to produce architecture that was different, that makes people, you know, question life as it was before. Yeah. But not everyone is like that. And there is no shame, you know, that everything, you find your truth. You need to be honest with your truth. Find what your truth is. And if that means working for a boutique for a while, hating it, and then working for a commercial for a while, hating it, and then working somewhere in between, yeah. you find your niche. Never give up on finding your truth, finding your passion, finding the joy in waking up every day and going to work. That is your number one priority. You need to find that. And the number two priority is get paid what you believe is worth it. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people, it's, it's a balancing act for them. Yeah. You know, they get paid a lot, a lot of money, but they don't, there's not so much passion in their work. Hmm. But you know, they do it. They're good at it and they do it, but because they earn like ridiculous amounts of money, it compensates. Yeah. Some people earn normal wage and there's a lot of passion. So you find that balance that is, it works for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's, it's a personal choice. I, I, I want people to really experiment. Just yeah. experiment and do not settle. Okay. And I think at, at a young age, that's the perfect time to experiment. You're unmarried, because, you have children. Yeah. Responsibilities you are less. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And yeah. you know, for me, I think if, if I really wanted to, um, like a lot of people who graduated with me, they were very design orientated. They wanted to work for these boutique boutique firms, like, you know, like Zaha Hadid and Norman Foster, for example, you know, these superstar architects, and these people don't pay, you know, they, they don't pay you. So this was, this wasn't something that I was able to do, you know, I did not, in, in, in retrospect, I could have planned for this, I could have saved throughout my studies, and, and got summer jobs. In, in the same way that people save for gap years, and they save to go, you know, uh, backpacking. Yeah. Yeah. It's an investment in self, an investment in opening up your horizon and your world. You could save for this kind of experience. I'm going to, I'm going to save up to be able to work for a company that I can afford to work for them for free. And a lot of, I know a lot of people who traveled all the way to Japan and worked for, you know, today or Ando, these amazing architects, yeah. they, they got paid nothing. You know, they got wow. paid zero, huh. but they saved up for that. And this was their investment in themselves. Yeah. And they came back and they went back to the UK and they said, you know, I worked for Tadeo Ando. It opened up other doors for them. It opened yeah. up doors yeah. to be able to work with other architects. And, you know, you guys, it does, you know, you, you work, you're studying in Lebanon or Egypt. You, there are design, you know, design and architecture, good design is emerging in these countries. 
mm -hmm. you can easily find them, you know, the emerging architecture awards, look for these awards. This is what I used to do. I used to like, you know, troll the internet and look for all of these awards and yeah. the award that resonates with me and just make lists and lists and lists and find contacts and emails and head of HR. And I used to apply for these guys. Just do that, do that. Yeah. And then also investigate research. What yeah. would make you attractive to them? You know, hmm. like an up and coming Lebanese design firm. If you graduated from Lebanon and you wanna work for them, then find out what they like. Say for example, they really like Japanese design then you invest in your, save up to go to Japan for three months and work for Today Ando or, you know, these companies. And yeah. that's your investment because when you come back, you know that when you submit your CV to this firm, this is your long-term vision. Yeah, you know, and that one. Submit, they will, they will like, you know, out of all the CVs they have, they will zero on on yours because they'll yeah. be like, look at this person. And the proactiveness, you know, as an employer now, man, being able to, to see a CV that, that demonstrates to me that this person is passionate about something and they are a go-getter and they do it, that, that is amazing. That is, that is, for me, that's like, I want this person in my team. And, and that's really perfect advice because that feeds in very well into the, the, my next question, which would be everybody graduates from architecture with the technical skills that they need. What more can a student do? And, and let me quickly recap. So you're talking about experience, uh, real life experience seems to be a very important thing. And, it's an, and, and look at it as an investment. So look at it by finding the design firm that you like and go there, even if you're not getting paid, right? So invest early so you can afford to do that. I love your recommendation about finding the awards. So finding the architectural awards that you like that resonate with you find the companies that have won these awards. And this is really a short list of what do I need to do or what skills do I need to develop other than my obviously technical skills to really grab the attention of these, of these organizations. And I love that, that, that really, you know, it, it sets a, a bit of a roadmap, uh, which, which is something that I think students find difficult. That, that roadmap at an early age can be quite difficult to, to see clearly. Uh, and, and I love that you really highlighted this in a, in a, in a pretty clear way. Also, I just want to add something, Ahmed. Uh, these friends of mine who went to Japan, they saved, yeah. but they also got other jobs. You know, they, they, they became English teachers, for example. Okay. You know, it, it paid for their accommodation. It, it paid for yes. other things. Now in Japan, it was very easy for them to get a job because the Japanese, like they, they think very highly of the Western, the Westerner. Yeah, yeah. You know, find, find, find a place where you would come in and you would be, you know, you, you, would, you would be appreciated mm -hmm. for things that you don't appreciate about yourself. You know, like this, my, my English friends that would go to Japan, just their nationality made them worth appreciation and it got them into the door. So, you know, just, just be a little bit open-minded about the skills that you have. When you graduate, it's not just your technical skills. Yeah. Your cultural background, your languages, your religion. You know, like in China, for example, there's a growing population of Muslims in China. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that a lot of Arabic speakers are on this webinar. You go to China, you become an Arabic teacher in the afternoons or on the weekend, yeah. and then yeah. you work for your preferred Chinese architect during the yeah. day, free. Or maybe get a little bit of pay, but you know, at least yeah, think yeah. of your skills. Think of your other skills. Harvest them. So, so I, I wanted to just mention to our attendees that if please, if somebody does that, because I have, I, I can talk to you honestly forever. I'm, I'm so interested in what you're saying, but but uh, just to make sure that everybody has the chance, if you if you guys want to ask questions please uh, raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk or feel free to post the questions uh, as we had mentioned on the, on the Q&A or, or, or on the chat. Uh, until we receive some questions, I, I have, so while I was doing some research, there are two points in particular that really struck with me that you mentioned. And I, and I saw that you mentioned these a couple of times in the different talks that you did. The first is failure. Uh, what does it mean? 
what does failure mean to you and how do you overcome failure Yeah, so I spoke about this in my TED talk. I spoke about this in my TED talk. I mean, you know, Ahmed, I have, um, I have not experienced much failure, which is a detriment to me because I don't have a lot of experience in how to bounce back from failure. I think throughout my childhood, I was always a top achiever in classrooms in my, in my school. I was always celebrated. I was always good at anything that I do. My first failure came uh, in my driving license. I just could not get a driving license. <laughs> this is in the UK, I'm assuming, right? No, this is here in Oman. Oh, I even know. <laughs> and, and, you know, I failed so many times that it became like a cycle because I was so nervous. It was like, you know, I failed because that was the comfortable thing to do. And you start becoming afraid of succeeding. But I, overca I overcame that. Now, my most recent and, and painful failure has been with, I mentioned this in the TED Talk, and I think... I won't talk about it, but I'll talk about the lessons that I extracted from that. And for me, the biggest thing from that experience was that I failed because I did not step into my truth. I did not step into, I love it in Alice in Wonderland when uh, the Tom, the, the Mad Hatter, I think tells Alice that, you know, your, your muchness your, your, your bigness, you know, your, your, your worth. Yeah. And I think we're scared of that. I was terrified of that. So what happened was that we won the largest project in the country and I am an SME, you know, I'm, I'm a small enterprise. I'm an award-winning small enterprise, but I am still a small enterprise and Oman is still a developing country. So all of our large projects are developed and delivered and implemented by large multinational organizations. So for me to win one of the largest companies in the world, for my company to win one of the largest projects in the country, there was this thing in my head that, you know, you cannot compute, cannot compute what happened, something went wrong. And then we partnered up with this other firm who was an expert in this kind of work, you know, the redevelopment of ports. So in my head, I was like, they won. We just helped them. Huh. You know, we are the local expert. We are the local architect. But throughout delivering this project, I was shown over and over again that no, Nadia, you won. Huh. You won yeah. and they are the expert to support you. It is your truth that won. It is your essence that won. It is inti khabaratik inti li ehna nridha. Humma al khabara illi baysaaduki. Lakin ehna nridik inti. And how did I react to that? La, 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 I can't. <laughs> <laughs> It was very, very, very scary. I was freaked out of the responsibility and the accountability of being able to to stand up to that kind of response, to that kind of ability. Yeah. yeah, I did not see it in myself, and and I think this is why I failed. This is why the project eventually was terminated because, I mean, there were lots of other reasons, but you know, for me, this is the lesson that I took home. Yeah. That, you know, like for me, in my mind, I couldn't compute that we won it. So yeah. I made up excuses. You won it because you're a female entrepreneur huh. and you're a female architect and you are an SME and you're Omani and you come from that place. Yeah. You know, that, that, that area was where my family come from. Yeah. So I was giving myself excuses every single excuse in the book I gave myself for winning this project, except the real reason, because yeah, I was sure. afraid to acknowledge that I am worth it. I can do it. And you yeah. have to acknowledge yourself. You have to honor الهديه من ربنا. أعطاكي هو يعني إذا الله سبحانه وتعالى يعطيكي موهبة ويعطيكي هدية, you have no right to deny it. Yes. Yes, yes. And you know, I'm thinking when you say that story, you, you, somebody, the person that awarded the project saw that and, and you, and you didn't. Yeah. Very and I think it, I, I didn't, and I don't know, like I've never spoken to them about it, but huh. you know, they must have seen it. They must have seen me shying yeah. away and they're huh. always like, Nadia, we want you. And I'm like, yes, yes, but this is what the expert says. Yes, yes, but this is what this guy says. And this huh. is what... What does Nadia say? What does 23 degrees north say? What does yeah. 
I mean, that's a, that's a great show. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, so, so I'm going to jump into some of the questions. We've, we've started receiving some questions. So the first one actually, and, and it's in the title of our talk, uh, uh, sustainability. The sustainability part of your work. Is that a big part of your job? How did you get into that? And is that, is that a differentiating factor within 23 degrees or...? or I mean, I think, I think it is a differentiating factor. 23 degrees north differentiates itself in the market because, because we are the first chartered Omani company in the country. Mm -hmm. So that differentiates us. We, we differentiate also because we, are, we work to professional standards. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are obliged to work to professional standards. And this is like a language that we can easily work with anyone around the world, either clients or subconsultants or partners. Now, the sustainability thing, it was an, a buzzword in 2011 when we set up, and it's still a buzzword now. But for me, sustainability is not a buzzword. Sustainability is inherent in everything that we do. And, and for example, buildings need to be sustainable. And my definition of that is that your building needs to be very considerate in how it consumes consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So how can you make your building consume less? Measure what the average building in your context consumes and then always try to reduce it. Measure the consumption of the building that you designed last mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. or last year. And that is the threshold and try to reduce the consumption, the build, the, the consumption of the building you're designing now because there's always ways of reducing consumption. And now the world isn't even talking about reducing consumption. They're talking about zero. They're talking about zero consumption buildings and they're talking oh. about plots. So buildings that produce an access. Oh, wow. So surplus. And okay. this is where the world is heading. Unfortunately, yeah. we're a little bit late. Okay. So from, an, from, a, from a consumption perspective, that is my, my piece. But I have always talked about sustainability from a cultural aspect as well, that there is this cultural sustainability that in Oman, for example, our traditional buildings have always been very sustainable, sustainable in the, in the, the way that they they're used. So settlements in Oman, in the mountains, the, the, the settlements are very, very dense, like a beehive. Mm -hmm. And all the buildings on the ground floor are shaded and dark, and they're used during the day. Okay. And all of the alleyways and the pathways between them, they become like corridors of a big building for the community because they're shaded and they're cool. Yeah. And then at night, these spaces become really hot because they've been exposed to the heat for so long. So yeah. everyone goes to the roof after the sun sets and the roof opens up to the sky and the roof is the first place to release all of this heat. Huh. So you, family moves there. So, you know, in, in the way that these spaces have been used, that there, there is a sustainability, there is an intelligent sustainability that is not found in all of your high-tech books. You won't learn this in university. Yeah. You will learn this by experiencing your own culture and by interpreting it in a modern way. Uh, wind tunnels, the, the, the fabric of the wall, you know, we used to build really, really thick walls with, with very deep windows. All of this is intelligence and it was designed for sustainable reasons, whether dealing with consumption or whether dealing with how we use the space, you know, the male, female separation, segregation, the children, all of these things, how we use spaces, privacy, the levels of privacy. You know, I, I often use the word hijab. We have a hijab in architecture. You have these different levels that you navigate the privacy of the dwelling, the heart of the building, and how you're able to use architecture to create a hijab and hijab in your in your buildings, whether they're a, they're a, they're a dwelling, a house, or a hotel, or an office building. So I like to speak about it from this perspective because you know you you speak about it in a language that is more in keeping with your own heritage. Yeah. You know, the sustainability is not something new. It's not something new to Egyptians. It's not something new to Omanis. It's not something yeah. new to Lebanese. It's not new to anyone. It's the way that we are able to to measure it and implement it is, is, is becoming more easy now because mm -hmm. technology is being invented and, and designed in ways that make it so much easier for us to have, for example, you can navigate between having larger windows, but still control how much heat gain these windows 
yeah. have through the technology of the glass. Yeah, yeah. For example. And, and so, in your, so, so and for you, sustainability isn't, it's an everyday thing. It's a part of the process, basically. It's embedded in everything. It's embedded in your thinking, in your design. And that's how you think about the sustainability. And, and not just in the design, and, but also in the culture and how the spaces are being used and utilized. I love that. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the first hard. time I've heard of sustainability in that, in that context. I, 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 it's, it's great. It's great to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to an, a couple of other questions because I, 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 we are running, uh, getting close to time. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, OK, this is uh, interesting. So, so how do you approach uh, your employer when you feel like you're underpaid and not appreciated as an architect, specifically for an expat? And this was by an anonymous, anonymous attendee. Yeah, so um, underpaid, yes. So the service sector is very difficult. You know, if, if I were selling a product, people pay. People pay a lot of money for Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Porsche because it's a well-designed product. Mm -hmm. But for us, what we're trying to sell is we are trying to sell a well-designed process. When we engage a client, there is no product. This product is co-created with them. So when we prepare a fee proposal, we are, we are almost preparing a forecast of how many hours, how much time it's going to take us to prepare something that they will really like. And mm -hmm. there is confidence that they will really like this because we have ways of engaging them in a way that it's not our design. It's, it's not our design, 23 Degrees North. It's co-created by both of us. And this is creating awareness and education. I mean, as an architect, I spend a lot of time educating the, communi the community about the value that architects can create over the value that engineers can create. Mm -hmm. Because engineers by themselves, they can problem solve. Once a problem is defined, then they're very good at solving that. But an architect is able to explore the problem, reframe it, and address it from the perspective of the client's priorities. And it's very difficult to convince anyone that that is of value. If a person does not feel it, if the person does not already value themselves and value their ability in co-creating something of value with you, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, again, it's a developing world thing, I think, where people are so used to just going to experts. Yeah. Tell me what to do. You tell me what to do. La, la, la. You tell me. Anna, I trust you. I don't want to co-create it with you. Ahna, we're not about that process. Ahna, we want to listen to you. We want to understand you, especially for bespoke projects, you know, like villas, hotels, like anything that we do is, is bespoke for you and your needs. So we really need to understand you and and they need to be very comfortable in, in entering that. And if they're not comfortable, they will never be comfortable with our fees. You know, it's yeah. it's kind of like an investment in self as well. So it, it's a very, very good question. And to be honest, I have not nailed it because I, especially now under, under the current economic conditions that we're facing, we are having to reduce our fees yeah. and we cannot reduce our service. You know, there's like a, a threshold where I cannot ethically yeah. do work, yeah. you know? Understood, understood. So it, it's... There, there, are, there are quite a few other questions, but I'm going to ask you one last question. Uh, relevant and, and there are a couple of people on chat and, and messaging asking if they can get in contact with you asking for um, to be employed by you so what i will recommend to those is i, I believe you mentioned nadia that you're on a channel on localized yes. uh, so i will recommend that if you guys want to get in contact with nadia uh, 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 search her out on localized go into her profile find the channel that she is leading and feel free to chat on that channel or comment and put on posts that she has put on on, on, uh, on the channel and that is the best way to, to reach out to her 
uh, th th there is one question which is kind of um, stemming from just what you said, and, and apologies for running a little bit over time here. Uh, the question is from uh, Muhammad. He said, we have heard a lot about how our man, I'm assuming Muhammad is our man. He says, we have heard a lot about how our man is young and behind, between quotation marks, in terms of architectural trends and technology. What does it take for us to speed up our pace and get there, again, between quotation marks, in part to standards of Gulf or globally? So I'd love to hear your, your, your feedback on that. And if you, and Nadia, if you open the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen, you see the Q&A button? Yeah. Do you see that question? Yes, yes. From Mohammed. Okay, so Mohammed, that, that's a really good question. To be honest, like, you know, this, this whole thing about being behind. So for example, when we talk about sustainability, Germany is probably one of the most um, advanced in terms of sustainability. And the UK is maybe 20 years behind them. The UK is 20 years behind Germany. And we are behind the UK, maybe around 10, 15 years behind the UK. We're, we're catching up very quickly to the UK because we are developing building codes, we are developing building standards. There is always progress, there's always, there, there is movement. And now there are so many young architectural firms um, popping up, which is a huge, this, like just driving around, you see so many villas that look modern. You know, they, they look like they're challenging what a villa can look like. And for me, this is already, we are speeding up our pace. It's already positive. People are talking about sustainability. You know, we, we built our first um, a, a, a building uh, funded by the government that's completely powered um, by a solar energy. And it was celebrated, you know, Sultan Haytham visited our building before he was Sultan, you know, this is amazing. So not only are these things recognized, talked about, but they're also celebrated. This means that we as a country, we are looking in the right direction. And this is wonderful. You know, this, this is where we need to be. And as long as there is this curiosity and there is this wanting, then we will get there. And it's not going to take us 20 years to catch up with Germany. It can take us much, much less. You know, this is just relative. So when we say that we are behind, this is an acknowledgement of where we are and where we can go. And we at 23 Degrees North, we are already challenging a lot of these things. And for example, one way of, of, of being behind is that, for example, all residential buildings are built with contractors these contractors are not really, they're not skilled labor. You know, I, it's, it's the skilled labor. Once we are able to have contractors, you know, the number of contracting companies who are registered in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. These contractors, they need to know about health and safety. Health and safety is a very, very important thing. You know, you, you need to have health and safety on site in order to have good design. And then yeah. you need to have good design to enable health and safety as well. And you need to have clients who are willing to pay for contractors who value health and safety. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a web. And unfortunately, one of the biggest hurdles with us is the cost. Whenever, like our fees compared to the other fees are quite significant. But this is because our fees include at least a hundred plus detailed design drawings. Mm. But 90% of the villas, and I'm using villas because everyone builds villas. 90% of the villas in Muscat are, are built with the drawings that are approved by Muscat municipality, which are ground floor, first floor penthouse, front elevation, and maybe one section, five drawings. Mm. And you build, the contractors build your house on five drawings and this is what the market is expected to pay. We produce detailed design and do coordinated electrical mechanical. Our fee is not the same, but that is good design. And yeah. that is safe design. And that is skilled labor contractor design. And, and the difference between the fee is, is unrealistic. You know, we cannot, we cannot force all the, the population to, to shift from this fee to this fee. It's going to be a slow process. Mm -hmm. 
it requires education. It requires us talking about sustainability, mm -hmm. health and safety. I mean, the government still subsidize our electricity. So there's no motivation to be sustainable. There's no motivation to consume less because yeah. the government is paying for it. Yeah. When the government stops paying for our electricity, then there will be a motivation for designers and architects to design buildings that consume less energy. Mm -hmm. Right now, Absolutely. there is. Okay. Nadia, thank you so much for that answer. I'm sorry for running a bit over time. For everybody that we didn't get a chance to answer your question, the link to Nadia's channel is on the chat. Please click on that link and join Nadia's uh, channel and free, feel free to follow up with your questions uh, there. Again, it was my pleasure talking to you, Nadia. I, I really did enjoy this. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, so much. And thank you for everyone who participated. And please do post your questions if they've not been answered on the channel at Localize. And it will take me some time, but I will answer them all. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you.